But all right, hey, went a little bit longer than I expected there. Let's get to this interview with Braden Gall, Athlon Sports, 440 Sports, all over the place here with Braden. I hope you guys really appreciate this uh, interesting interview that uh, I, I sure had a fun time recording with Braden. Braden Gall, thanks for coming in, man. Oh, we're rolling already, huh? All right. Just get right into it, man. No no need to – we've been BSing here for about 10, 15 minutes, so we're sh- cutting short for time. Cheers. Appreciate you coming in. This is yeah, the man. first time I've drank hard liquor in this studio, <laughs> but we, we've done beer many a time. Soft liquor, yeah. Yeah. So how's it going? It, it's it's good, man. Um, season always slows down. I appreciate that. Like I, I get to actually take a chance to breathe a little bit. Yeah, come in here, hang out with you, have a, have a, have a glass, have a sip, and um, holiday season's around the corner. So um, been good. How about you? Yeah, it's going well, man. And like you said, I love what I do. It's not even a job, really, <laughs> but I needed a slight break. You it, know what I mean, dude? It, it, it's funny because like I wonder how teams address this stuff, you know? Because it's funny. I always get to like middle of October. And the the excitement of the beginning of the season has worn off, right? You get so jacked up for, right. like, media days and, like, camps opening up and quarterback battles and all this fun stuff, new coaches. And then you you reach a – there's a grind point in the middle of the season where you're not close enough to championship Saturday in the playoff, but the but the initial fun has worn off, you know, like the, the adrenaline. And that's I, – I wonder how teams handle that. Like, that just in general, like, I'm assuming the best coaches have to work extra hard to get teams through – you know, like the last three weeks of October so that they can then say, look, we're three wins away from X or a bowl game or winning a division or, or whatever. And I feel the same way as a media member. <laughs> you know, think about us, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like people need to worry about us. Here. No. Well, let me ask you that. Do you think that's why there's not the sole reason, but do you think that is a reason there's so many bowl opt-outs? Like players are just like, why the hell do I want to go to? Because I'm, I'm surprised we even got it in like the Orange Bowl for Tennessee players. And you're I'm, surprised people are opting out? Yes. Why? Because Tennessee, I mean, you know as well as anybody, I mean, it's been a decade plus of dismay. This is one of the biggest games most of these players will ever play in their life. I mean, I mean, and, I would ask why. Like, why would Jalen Hyatt, and why would Jalen Hyatt, like, hit the most important moment? the of, best bowl game he's ever played was a Music City Bowl. Well, but what does a bowl game really mean to, like, it's not 1975, you know, when the Sugar Bowl was like one of six bowls, and... If you got there, you don't think there's something to winning eleven games at Tennessee oh, sure. that hasn't won. When's the last time they won sure, eleven but games? You can, I don't think you and I can be upset about it if his teammates don't care. You I'm know? not upset, so. but I'm just wondering. It just it's I guess it's just surprising. Like I get it. At I, I'm not surprised. If you have NFL upside, right? Like you could be right now working on. Ra- now I'll give him credit because he's actually going to be with the team, right? Uh-huh. Um, like right now he could be in Arizona working with a receiver specialist training for the combine, mm-hmm. which is like eight weeks away, which is the most important moment of his entire life. Right from a from a financial future standpoint, and so it's not a surprise at all that you want to take a knee injury off the table, mm-hmm. right? Like I don't think that like that that weighing that to ten wins versus eleven wins or an Orange Bowl win for Jalen Hyatt in his life, I just don't think it's and and again his teammates don't care at all. Like Joey Joey Bosa famously sat out the entire season. Like he got injured yeah. in like week two and he sat out the whole season. And the most support he got was from his Ohio State teammates. So GMs don't care. Uh, I don't. I kind of find it interesting that, and I'm not saying you're doing this. I find it interesting that we're still having the conversation. That that fan Tennessee fans are like, well, how could you how could you quit on your team? And I'm like, the team doesn't think that. <laughs> like the team doesn't <laughs> give a shit. Sorry, can we cuss? <laughs> oh yeah, it's completely <laughs> unedited. That's what I thought. But like the team doesn't care at all. So you can't be more offended than than the teammate is, and the teammate is supportive of Jalen Hyatt. So Leonard Fournette, Christian McCaffrey, they sat out. They both went top ten in the draft. Uh, David Ajabo from Michigan last year uh, injured his knee in pr- warming up in in the combine, and it cost him right. hundreds of thousands of dollars in the draft. So I don't blame people for choosing their own financial best interests and minimizing risk at the most important part of their entire lives. I just don't. Now I, let me ask you this: a little slightly different, but it's also a, another opt out. But it, it's really just going pro and, and, and focusing on that. But what do you think? What do you make of Anthony Richardson going pro? And not playing again. I guess you can make the same argument. Las Vegas Bowl. Who cares? Uh, Especially you know, with no no other players on the Florida team playing in the game. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, but what what do you think about him actually making that decision to not not to miss the game, but to go pro? Because I mean, how many games of film does he have? Not a lot. And and not a lot of training in 
what the NFL offenses are going to ask him to do. Yeah. Like, how do you beat him? You beat him this year when, when they were playing in, against high-level competition. Yeah. The way you beat him is just keep him in the pocket and make him throw, make him work through his progressions and try to pinpoint the guys in the pocket. Because once he gets out of the pocket, you know, everybody saw what he could do in the Utah game, the Tennessee game. Like, his athletic ability is so captivating for NFL people. It's ob- I mean, I don't think you – don't, you don't even need to be a scout to see the talent. Right. Like, the talent's there. I think he's going to have a very difficult time adjusting to NFL defenses. And it's going to take – I think you, if you're going to draft him in the first round, let's say, you better be willing to, to train him for two years. Like, maybe have him sit for a couple of years. Like, I think if – I don't think you can expect anything Richardson to start right away. I just don't think he's yeah. – I don't think the, the – the game awareness and the processing and the understanding of coverages, I don't think it's there yet. I think he gets there. But you draft him because he's six four, two hundred and forty pounds and runs a four <laughs> four. Right, right. Like right. he's a freak in nature athletically. I was a little surprised he didn't uh not only up not that he opted out, but th- I thought he would enter the portal and see what are these NIL offers out here. I mean I realize NFL That's an interesting angle. is a lot more I don't know that he's guaranteed to be a first-round pick. I don't even know if he's guaranteed to be a second-round pick. I assume he is, but I would have tested both waters, so to speak, if that makes sense. I, I, that's a good strategy, and I do think it's an interesting one. If you're, I think if you're clearly not a draftable player or like a sixth or seventh-round fringe draft pick. Like what would he do in Josh Heupel's offense? He'd be pretty good. Um, <laughs> again, I, the accuracy yeah, is a question. Yeah. Um, I, that's why I think Joe Milton isn't very good and and has never been good. And I took my I took my six year old to her first ever SEC football game, and the reason she got to see so many big touchdowns is because Tennessee ran the ball against Vanderbilt, <laughs> <laughs> not because because Joe Milton missed. Other than the first pass to Jalen Hyatt, like on the first play, yeah, I think he missed like thirty seven open receivers after that. So. I actually think the name I really love for Heupel's offense is DJ Uyunglele from Clemson. Who's oh, in the, really? Who's in the portal. I yeah. think he would run that offense really well. Just deep shots, physical, run the football. I, you know, I, he could be a really nice piece in there. And I think he would be an improvement. He's not just another Joe Milton. I haven't I think seen he's much better, of him. I think he's know? better than Joe Milton. I think he's more accurate. That's yeah. all. Okay. Again, Milton is a great everything, He, but you have to be able to throw the football yeah. to your teammates <laughs> at some point. Uh, but Richardson, I think – like I've talked to some scouts and – um, I'll I'll reach down and pick up this name here, but I was talking to Mel Kuyper about it, and Ooh. he has. I was like, "How is it? How has this season changed your board? How has it affected who you like and who you don't like?" And he's like, "I came into this season with C.J. Stroud number one. I'm leaving with Will Levis at number one overall." And I was like, "Really?" Uh, and he goes, "And I think Anthony Richardson's going to fly up boards. I've got him at number three behind Stroud." And I was like, "Wow." He's like, "Who?" He goes, "Brayden, who would you take?" And I go, "Bryce Young, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> Bryce Young." I've stood next to him, and I know Bryce is – like, I'm not a small person. I, He's I, tiny. I, I, Bryce is a small dude, but the things he does, nobody else can do. Yeah. Uh, so I would take Bryce number one, but I, I think Richardson – Every you know this stuff. Every NFL scout thinks they can fix everything. Mm-hmm. That's why you draft Maurice Claret, you know, and because you, you think you can fix it, and sure enough, he ends up drinking vodka on the practice field. You, you, <laughs> you, these coaches are so – Is that bad? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Out of a water bottle. Um, It's funny. It's just like you're going to see Anthony Richardson's specs, and you're going to see the tape, and it's not going to match in your head as a scout. But it doesn't matter because they they, – again, (laughs) the number one pick last year was like the fifth or sixth best defensive player on Georgia's team. Yeah. (laughs) So it's all about these freakish athletic stuff, um, and they fall in love with it. They think they can fix the other stuff, and I think Anthony Richardson is – I think he's a first-round pick. I think he's a late first-round pick. Uh, somebody will take a chance on the on the talent, and if that's where you're at on boards, and that's what scouts are telling you, and NFL people are telling you, and agents are telling you, then you got to go pro. Right. You got you got to go pro because even even the best NIL deals are not close to first round money. Right. Right. And starting your clock as soon as possible to to make real life altering revenue, which again is why you sit out a bowl game. Mm-hmm. Well, we already went off the rails from what I was <laughs> planning on going. Is, you can attest to, yeah, that, and also I got no notes. So I don't like notes when we're doing it in person. No, man. I think that, it's rude. That's the best way to go. But I want to ask you because, to my knowledge, this is basically like the only real job you've ever had is, is like media stuff. I could be wrong, but yeah, no, yeah. I'm, what, I'm, what's re- like you like you said earlier? Like, what's a real job? Like, I don't. Right, right. So I, I'm just curious your your background for those that don't know. I mean, every, everybody knows you from ESPN Radio and Athlon Sports and now 440 Sports. Uh, I, I was just wondering if you could. 
you know, share your story a little bit. Sure. And, and how you got into all that, and, and like, I don't know why anyone would care. But like I'm, I said, you're you're not that old yet. It seems like you've been doing this for like 30 <laughs> years. I'm like, how's that happen? Uh, I am 40. I'm a man. Uh, I can say that I'm a man. I'm 40. Um, come at me. Uh, I, so it started. Uh, I, I worked at a rock and roll station in college. I went to University of Tennessee and. Uh, literally, uh, I was working at a rock and roll station one night, and they were changing the hip hop station to a sports format, to the sports animal, and they literally were switching overnight from a hip hop station to a sports station. And the program director, Mickey Deerstone, if you listen to Vols, Lady Lady Vols basketball, or or know anything about Tennessee athletics, he was my boss at the time, and he just goes, "Hey, do you want to?" I'd been there for about uh, six, eight months, kind of pre-graduation and then after graduation I said he goes you want to work on a sports channel I was like hell yeah so I started producing the midday show um I think so you he, started the sports animal I started technically I started Josh Ward yeah uh, taught me literally everything I know about radio because and he was like a 19 year old kid who was teaching a graduate <laughs> about how to do like run a board and you know set up remotes and all this other goofy stuff I had so much fun on the rock side of things because I was doing I'm a huge music fan, yeah. and so I was doing a lot of really cool stuff with like music that I never thought I was like introducing a band in front of a club show at Blue Cats in the Old City. Like, yeah, that's a deep cut for those of you who know Knoxville. Yeah, and and then get, getting the chance to work in sports, I just was like, all right. So for two weeks, I did this show, midday production. Brent Hubbs fills in. Oh well, he's yeah. driving down to Rivals for uh, the, the the Rivals dot com national convention. He takes my resume down on a Friday. Gives it to the head of Rivals Radio at the time, which had launched like four months earlier in Nashville. I got a call on Monday. I drove down on Tuesday to interview. They offered me the job, and I said yes without even thinking for like twenty grand a year in Brentwood, Tennessee, which is a very expensive place to live. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. Did not even contemplate the information. Uh, and had started, you lived in Nashville before? I went to high school in Nashville. Okay. Uh, so I, I was... And I, I, at the time, I was dating somebody who was moving back, so I was looking to get back to Nashville. Gotcha. But the idea of starting on as a producer for the only national college sports talk show in the history of this country and working at Rivals.com headquarters was just like, I was like, oh. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. like I was like, this is, um, this is incredible. I'm going to – now, I had to get up at 4 in the morning, and we were on the air at 6 a.m. And right. I, like, but I, it was a three-hour – it felt like a three-hour graduate class in college football because it's all we did was talk recruiting and coaching and games and players, and I, I I was in heaven. And so I just learned. I just soaked it all in. So would you consider that you got lucky? Or, I guess. Or were you, sure. just, were you just that good at right out the gate? Or? I mean, I wasn't. I, again, I didn't. Like, if they wanted to hire between me and Josh Ward a better producer, Josh Ward was a better producer. So it wasn't – I mean, I'm, almost everything I've learned is sort of self-taught in the radio business. Um and I'm willing. I, look, I, I work extremely hard. Yeah, I'm not going to back down on that. I, you, you got like 20 jobs. Everybody may work as hard as me, but no one works harder. Um, <laughs> I, I joke all the time, but I just right place, right time. Brent Hubs is a great ally to have. Sort of saying, "Hey, look, I got this this kid who's going to work real hard. He knows sports." Yeah. And I had known recruiting a little bit before then, because again, I was a huge sports nerd growing up. I'd lived in Texas and Georgia and moved around and just a huge college. My first college football game I was like five at TCU my second one was like Georgia Tech in Atlanta then I went to Longhorn games in Texas like I just grew up going to college football games all across the country and so it was sort of like this natural like weird situation so I started rivals.com we we go from 10 hours a week two hours a day to like 30 hours a week Sirius and XM merge my favorite moment is coach coach Ordron coming into the office with Hugh Freeze wearing matching leather jackets with embroidered this is when Ole Miss. he was working under Coach O. He, 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 this was Coach O had just gotten the Ole Miss job, and uh -huh. they show up at the Rivals. dot com office, and me and my me and my other like twenty four year old buddies are like, "What the hell is happening? Why is Coach O walking through our office?" And his lap dog, Hugh Freeze, is walking right next to him, not saying a word to anybody, like walking yeah. a step behind him, wearing matching again. The, my favorite part: matching leather jackets that have Ole Miss <laughs> embroidered on the chest. <laughs> And they're just like walking through the office, getting to know because Coach O was obsessed with recruiting rankings. And right, we got him to do some like liners and some reads. He couldn't do any of them right. Like <laughs> it was so much fun. I wrote it down in like size twelve font or size like twenty five font on a piece of paper, like double space, so that he could read it. And he's like, "You're listening to Rivals Radio on Cyrus One Two Three, and you're like, "It's serious, Coach." 
uh, and it's 123, <laughs> but whatever. It's not. And we ran that promo like a hundred million times because it was wrong. <laughs> right, <laughs> so right, right. We, th- we thought it was the funniest shit in the world. Um, Sp- speak. I hate to. Cut and then you I off. moved to Athlon in 07, and after that, it's it's a it's you know the rest is history. So just to to go along with that though, real quick, did you ever read the book The Blind Side? I know oh, yeah. everybody's seen the movie. And Michael Lewis is one of my favorite authors of it's all time. It's very different than the movie. The book's way better than the, the movie. But I thought it was interesting. So apparently Hugh Freeze had cut deals to join Tennessee staff, Philip Fulmer, and he was steering Michael Orr to Tennessee. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then he didn't want to go to Tennessee, obviously, so he went to Ole Miss. And the story is Hugh Freeze flew down to wherever Coach O was at and, and basically pitched, you want to get the most out of this kid. You yeah. gotta hire me, so it, it kind of goes funny <laughs> with your story. Well, and my favorite part of the Righteous Gemstones Baby Billy performance that Hugh put on uh, <laughs> at the press conference—I uh, just don't believe anything he says. What was was the shout out to the Tuies who were there in person? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, aside from crying about golfing with media members or whatever, like there's a lot of garbage there. But like he, when he's like, "Oh, they're the Tuies over there, my best friends," and I'm like. Man, that's a deep cut, uh, especially considering what we know about what you did at Briarcrest <laughs> yeah. in Memphis. They are apparently responsible so. as well. Uh, I can't remember if it was getting Saban to Alabama or getting Saban to LSU, but they were they provided the plane and it, like that that family. I yeah. don't know much about them aside from the movie and the book. If they got Saban to to Bama or LSU, then they hurt themselves. <laughs> right. That's why it, it didn't make sense. No, to I don't me. think it was. But I, I think they liked the power. Or something like they may, like, maybe. like they provided the transportation that you couldn't track. I don't think some story like that. I don't. I, I, I also just read uh, just read Talty's book. Um, I, haven't, I haven't read John that. Yet. Talty it's, it's about pretty the, good. The leadership secrets of Nick Saban. It's it's interesting. I think it's there's a lot of inter- anecdotes in there about like how Steve Sarkeesian was going to be the head coach and waiting at Alabama. Um, lots of really interesting stuff. But but a big part of it is Saban's move from Michigan State to LSU and sort of how each time he moved, he grew and changed and evolved. And so now we're off on a different topic here. But but it's really interesting to read how he gets to LSU and how LSU wanted him and didn't want him and yeah. didn't know what to expect. Again, we talk about Brian Kelly not being a cultural fit, which I don't think matters at all. Nick Saban wasn't a cultural fit at LSU. He was a damn good football coach. Right. And that's all they needed. And they finally – LSU finally kind of figured it out. Kind of like Clemson, they figured out investment. They figured out – Whole, this holistic approach to elevating everything in the program financially, Saban then just took it and ran. And of course, unfortunately, while I was in college, uh, <laughs> with a backup quarterback, upsets the 01 team in the SEC championship game for Tennessee, and uh, the rest, as they say, for Nick Saban is history. But um, I don't know what your first question was. <laughs> what? Well, let me ask you this: you, Do you have a uh, a Hugh Freeze any like favorite story that you're willing to share? Uh, favorite? Uh, none of them are good. Um, or maybe most, I don't know, just just the best story, you know? Uh, I mean, I've – Hugh is famous for name searching and DM sliding. Yep. Um, maybe my claim to fame is that I've gotten a few of those. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, almost all of them exclusively after positive tweets. Like, I think these are the top ten candidates for XYZ job. Hey, thanks for mentioning me. Appreciate it. Let's talk, blah, 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 blah. And, like, he's just it's, – it's this constant – everything you know – about him from the local reporters is almost all true. I think he's, I think he's creepy. I think he's weird. I don't think he's a criminal. I don't think he should go to prison. But I think there's a bit. I think there's a difference between like being ha- having a leadership role as the most important and influential and highest paid person on a campus full of women who are going to experience, to in some way, shape, or form, something assaulty-ish. Right, right. And like that happens on every campus. It's not an Auburn problem. It's just a problem on every campus, regardless of, of where you are. And having him, who clearly has twenty years of questionable behavior in and around this subject, I mean, again, he's making eighth grade girls change, you know, without any witnesses, take their shirts off in front of him, right. he's paddling girls in middle school and high school in nineteen ninety nine as a grown adult with no witnesses, <laughs> like it's just the weirdest shit. And so, for then. 20 years later to be sliding up into DMs of assault victims, it's clear that the behavior has not changed and that he's just, he desperately wants everyone to like him. And I understand that sentiment. It doesn't mean you, you can, there's certain lines you can't cross that kind of, again, it's not criminal. It's just creepy and weird. Yeah. And I don't, I think there's a, there's a gap between going to prison and being the head coach at Auburn to make $9 million a year as the most powerful person in a leadership role where you've clearly indicated that you don't have that skill in this department of, of keeping women safe on campus. So 
again, I, I'm not saying Auburn should or shouldn't do it. I'm saying Auburn should own it because I know what Hugh Freeze has done and how he's acted and how he treats people and what he cares about. And that whole thing, that whole press conference, I'm not sure I believe a word he said. Like, I just, it's just my personal opinion. Right, right. You know, if you don't like it, fine. I think he's a solid coach. I think the bigger question about Hugh Freeze is, like, is he actually good enough? I don't think he's – I think he's a good coach. I think he's going to win nine games. But, like, Gus Malzahn beat Nick Saban, right, three he, times? He beat, uh, beat Nick Georgia Saban. a couple times. Beat Georgia a couple times. Uh, an SEC championship Georgia. Like, pulverized them that <laughs> year in 2017. <laughs> like, runs the same system. Doesn't have any baggage. <laughs> <laughs> like, you just hired a worse version of <laughs> Gus Malzahn to replace Gus Malzahn, and then you spent $30 million in the process to do it. I don't get it. I don't yeah. get it. Like, that same team that beat Alabama, which took five turnovers inside their own 40-yard line to do that, lost to Memphis. Well, I think the funniest thing Arkansas. is Arkansas. the people that made that decision, that they were the people that run off Gus. So it was. it's kind of like an admission yeah. of, and they've uh, wanted, fucked up. And they've wanted Hughes since he got let go from Ole Miss. And, yeah. and if you notice, I didn't say one thing about escorts, about paying players, about university cell phones, don't give a shit about any of that stuff. Like, I if, thought he was more relatable when I found out he was getting. <laughs> I was like, this is a guy I will hang out with. <laughs> like paying players now is cool. The problem is, like, that's the coolest thing he's ever done, probably. But but what <laughs> the problem is is that that wasn't a huge advantage for him at the time. It's not an advantage for him anymore. Right so now, everybody's doing it. So I don't that that brings him down a peg again. That's another question. It's just a huge risk. Um, I again, like, do I think you know? Escorts and prostitution should be legal and regulated in this country. Yes, I do. I think victim victimless crimes should be. We should be allowed to do whatever we want, and let's let's whatever. Like, I don't think that's that controversial that people can use drugs or, you know, drink alcohol or you know, like whatever. Like, do what you want to do in this country. Um, I don't care about any of that stuff. That what a man does between is between in his marriage is between him and his wife. I don't care. It's not my business. But, you know, intimidating. Sexual assault victims in the middle of federal investigations, not cool. <laughs> it's not a cool thing to do. <laughs> so I, Auburn, just own it. Just say, look, we're valuing football over everything else, and if anything happens, it's on us. Yeah. And that's what you got to do. And, like, that's it. Your priorities are football, and that's fine. It's the SEC. But just tell us that. Don't talk to us like we're freaking toddlers. Right, right. right. All right, I hate to do another 180, but I, I, was, I thought Throw. about this while you were uh, discussing, you know, your, your, your rise, so to speak, in the media world. But so I'd, try, I'd call it a rise. You so. were essentially there from the start of like internet radio to now you got your own business, which is not internet radio, but it's kind of like. It's, Based, it's, I mean, it kind of is. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I kind of can. That's when old people are like, what do you do? That, I'm like, you've heard <laughs> of the radio, <laughs> right? People. Like, it's like it's like the internet, but it's like, yeah. So what? my question to you, though, is like, what what is your thoughts on the on the state of like radio and 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 Shitty. entertainment? <laughs> well, not just just radio, but yeah. I mean, I I feel you because I I've been offered jobs here in Nashville, and I'm like, I very much appreciate the consideration, but not interested at all. You know, it's funny. I, I was talking to somebody. I'll I'll keep their name out of it, but somebody very very high on a national radio platform, like two years ago during the pandemic, and one of the things that stuck in my head about the conversation, because I've been in radio my whole life, but Sirius XM as a satellite on the college football channel is sort of a hybrid between regular radio and a podcast. And part of the reason I love a podcast, which, you know, r YouTube podcast, digital content, like what you and I do is like, we get to spend time with stuff. We get to, we can, you and I can sit here and talk about like Liam Cohen's influence on Kentucky for like 30 minutes if we wanted to. And if you care about that, you're going to be with us on that conversation. You cannot do that in radio. Right. There is a science to radio where I have to win the quarter hour by keeping you listening for five minutes. I've got to yeah. move on from subject A to subject B to subject C as fast as possible. Keep you moving. Set up audio. Tease the tease going into break. Come pay off the tease when we come out of break. There is a science to it all. Create conflict. Increase anxiety and enragement and keep you tuned in whether you agree with me or disagree with me. It is a scientific medium. And you execute it. Like when I do ESPN radio, I have to execute it that way. On Saturday mornings, it's, you know, we can't spend 30 minutes on Liam Cohen. We, right. we have to talk about the Iron Bowl for two minutes, and then we got to move on. And Sirius XM, w I was sort of training without knowing for podcasts and digital w space because it's, you don't have to live by those same rules because we've already eliminated anyone who doesn't care about college football. So you tune into that channel because you care about college football. So I could spend 10 minutes talking about, 
you know, the, uh, the, the Oregon offensive coordinator, Kenny Dillingham, going to become the head coach at Arizona State. I could spend eight or nine or ten minutes on that on a segment because that audience already wants the college football content. So that's sort of a middle ground because you still have to operate within the stay entertaining, keep people up here, keep people engaged, that kind of stuff. It's not like this where we get to sit down and just see where it goes like two normal human beings. Right. Um, but radio, like when you hear someone on radio and you're pissed off about what they're saying, just know that they've won. <laughs> that's their job is to get you enraged and engaged. And if that if that's what they're do- – like there's a guy in, in Nashville that gets all kinds of heat for being this hot take guy. And I'm like, that's because that's the nature of the business. The nature of the business is not Howard Stern. Right. The nature of the business is Skip Bayless. Say outlandish shit to get people pissed off on both sides, agreeing and disagreeing. And as long as I can create that situation where I've got two divided groups of people arguing over one topic, I've picked the right topic as a radio host. And that's not what we want to do in our world, at least I, for me. Yeah. I want to sit and talk about Mike Leach for 45 minutes and really understand the man, the stubbornness, the complications, the quirkiness, the insatiable desire to learn and read, and how that led him to the air raid and how the air raid has now influenced Literally everything you see on any football field. Mike Leach is the most influential name and mind of our generation. High school, pro, college, full stop. And you cannot have that conversation on radio. You just can't. You have to do it in a space like this or on a podcast or on a YouTube video. Like It's got to be in a digital world. And the conversation I had to bring it back to that one guy that I was talking to who was extremely successful, president of one of the biggest sports radio companies in, in the country, I was talking to him about this, all this same stuff, and he goes, talent's not the problem, content's not the problem, the distribution model is fucked. And how many radios do you own? I own one. It's in my truck. That's it. This. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is where everybody gets their information. And I still think there's a, there's a uh, certainly there's thin uh, lack, lack of depth on a lot of apps you know instagram and tiktok is just straight 10 second consumption with no depth at all but it all there's also a lot i think there's a big appetite for what you do and for what i do and and that is to have really thoughtful entertaining silly funny serious conversations about the things that we love right and in this case sec football and just enjoy it like like let's let's debate like marcus satterfield leaving is that good or bad for south carolina i don't know (laughs) south carolina fans aren't sure I certainly don't think they did a good job hiring, <laughs> but but like we can debate that and have a really interesting conversation with it. That doesn't work anywhere else. Yeah. The distribution model of radio is the problem, not the people or the content. It's the model. Do you th- and I, w- I would assume that that you do, but do you think as time goes on, that's just more and more and more of a dead model? Cause so I, twenty, because I don't know how anybody younger than me listens to that. Cause yeah, I, yeah, and I can't listen to it. It's it's convenience in a car probably, but I don't. Again, I put I plug the phone in and I'm or I Bluetooth right. the phone in and I'm I'm listening to pods all day. That's, That's what all everybody do. does or right. music. So it's interesting. Twenty twenty, and part of the reason I launched my company was these these trends. Twenty twenty was the first year where men twenty five to fifty four in this country got their sports content more from podcasts than sports talk radio. It's the first time that it that it that they 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 switched right right and. And the ad spending, of course, is off the charts. You got Patreon shows, you got all kinds of stuff, and so it's just, again, I think there's obviously a thirst for in-depth, thoughtful, nuanced, funny, creative content, all of which sort of gets sanded down when you do radio. Right. And I just don't like if I if I need a press conference, if I'm trying to listen to a press conference for Mike Vrabel for the Titans, that's when I'll probably turn on the radio because I want to listen to the press conference if I'm driving somewhere during during that time. Mm-hmm. Um. But, like, there's not a part of me. And I, and I love and respect all the people in Nashville that do radio. Like, I know all of them personally. They're all very talented and very good. But the model, like, I'd rather talk to those hosts on a podcast <laughs> because then I actually get, am going to get time to hear what they have to say. Like, you know, Joe Rexrode is a friend of mine. He writes eloquently about SEC football, the Titans, the Preds, everything in Nashville. I, he's got a four-hour show. And I'm like, Joe, I don't listen to your show, dude. I'm sorry. Like, I had a beer with him the other night. And I'm like, I don't listen to your show. But I'll sit here and talk to you for an hour about what, those t- those same topics are because I'm going to get better content. I'm going to get more thoughtful and nuanced content. And I don't mean like off the record stuff. I mean like yeah, the same exact conversation about why Landon Hooker wasn't in New York. He and I can have a very different conversation sitting around a table having a beer 
than he has to have on the radio. And so that's that to me, that's all the podcast is. It's just me and you sitting here talking about why Hendon Hooker belonged in New York. Stetson Bennett didn't belong anywhere near it. And let's have that conversation in a in a thoughtful and creative and funny way instead of you turn on your radio and you're like, I can't believe Stetson Bennett is New York. That's just terrible. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Call in. What do you think? <laughs> like it's th- that's yeah. Let's talk about it. Let's have a more time with it, and because people care about it. Like Tennessee fans care that Hinton Hooker didn't go. I I sh- I would tell you Tennessee fans relax. <laughs> Don't worry about it. it. Doesn't take away from the memories. I voted him number two on my ballot. Yeah, I saw good. that. And you had Bryce Young. You had the correct ballot. I had Bryce Young on th- at three. Hinton Hooker two. Caleb Williams one. But. And I understand, ten- I had so many text messages that are just like, I can't believe you didn't get to New York. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, eventually I just go, who cares? Like, don't get outraged by it. He's going to finish fifth. If he, do- if he doesn't play poorly against Georgia and South Carolina, doesn't get hurt, he probably wins the thing. That sucks. You can think about that if you want to. Or you can remember the Alabama game. Yeah. And you can remember ten wins for the first time since I was in college. I- again, I took my <laughs> daughter. I, th- I think there's so much serendipity to this. My six-year-old daughter melted down because I wasn't taking her to the Vanderbilt Tennessee game. Like melted down. And if you have kids, you understand like the scream from the other room when they're hurt, somebody's hurt. It's a real different scream. There's the the cry, whine, <laughs> mope scream where you're just not getting what you want, and you're like, <laughs> and you're like, you can tell what that is. This was like in between, and I've never heard it before. She was genuinely disappointed in me as a father. She <laughs> she, she was like. Because t- cause we've taught her Go Big Orange in Tennessee and all this stuff, and like I, I don't I don't put that persona out there on my shows very often because I want to stay objective as possible. That's just my preference. Yeah. And she and it was raining that night. It was kind of cold in Nashville, and I'm like, but you know, it, they'll be here in two years. We'll take her to Neyland next year. But she's like, like falls on the ground and like into my arms, like c- climbs on top of me and is like just sobbing into my chest. <laughs> and and I look at my wife, and my wife's like, her eyebrows grow up and go, because like the game had just kicked off, and we were watching it at home, and so we, I, I was like, all right, let's go, honey. We get in the truck, we drive over to West End, we find a free parking spot. I get two free tickets. We walk in, <laughs> we sit on the thirty yard line. She's standing in the rain for two and a half quarters, watching big play after big play after big play. She looks around one time, and she goes, Dad, there's a lot of orange here. And I was like, Welcome to Vanderbilt football, honey. And <laughs> but like. That that the fact that I got to take my daughter to her first ever SEC football game was, and it happened to also be the first time Tennessee had won ten games since I was in college in two thousand three. It just felt so like holistic and like yeah. the way it was supposed to be. And um, obviously, I've, I'm raising a monster <laughs> as, as well. <laughs> She's been indoctrinated into Nashville music and SEC football, so maybe I'm doing my job after all. Yeah, it sounds like the perfect dad right there. <laughs> But going back to, you know, the business model and where things are, the the, the other thing that I really like about it, and uh, don't feel, don't you don't have to share anything you don't want to. Sure. But myself, I've been laid off by. Oh, I've been fired twice. Fox Sports. And, and yeah. the whole time I was at Saturday Night South, there was threat of getting laid off. When I launched my podcast, they threatened to fire me. When I got more reviews than theirs, they threatened to fire me. <laughs> when I was getting these big time interviews, so you're doing they your threatened job, to fire me. Threatened to fire you. On and on and on. And I think there's something to be said for that as well, where, you know, I, I, you, you do have a, a like I said, a, a lengthy history. So, you know, people, maybe it's a little different, but there, I think there's people listening right now that are like, man, I'd love to start a podcast. There's literally nothing stopping them. And the barrier is, is incredibly yeah. low to start it. And I think that is, is more powerful. Like if, if I wanted to be a Nashville radio host, that's, that's something you got to work toward. And there's, there's, there's barriers to get you there. There's no barriers. Buy a damn camera. Buy this equipment. Yeah. It's not that yeah. expensive. Throw it up on the internet, and if it's good, people will find it and they'll tune in. I th- I just think that's outstanding. Yeah. What year? Um, I'd be curious because we launched. So I work. At, I still work at Athlon Sports. We've done a cover, the Cover Two podcast, which is all national. Excuse me, college football, and we started that in 2014, and I feel like that was pretty early for sort of like podcasting in general. Uh huh. Um, and. And so I, I had experience in that area. I was fired by I was fired by rivals for no reasons at all. Not, not I can I could rattle them off and we can go through the history. But uh, I was I, I was so oh seven I moved from rivals to Athlon uh, less than a month. One of the best things that ever happened to me. Spent forty five minutes upset with it. Had a beer with my dad and he's like, "You don't have to get up at 
four o'clock tomorrow morning. I was like, oh, that's great. <laughs> had two more beers, <laughs> uh, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me, honestly, because I I learned from it. I learned some. I had I made some mistakes. You know, I figured that out. I corrected those things. Got into Athlon. Learned the print business. Learned the editing business. The writing business. Got so much experience, and technically, I'm still working there now, like 17 years later. Yeah. 15 years later. Um, again, as a kind of like a, I'm not a full time employee, but I still work there. Um, and then my, my show locally in Nashville was canceled, like a, at the start of the pandemic, basically not because of the pandemic, but that they just were going to make a change. And I was unemployed. I, I was still working at Athlon and Sirius and ESPN. So I had my four jobs. So only one of them was gone, <laughs> but I, my, my, I had a three and a one year old at the time. The tornado hits Nashville, closes my kid's daycare. We needed someone to be home with the kids. And I happened to be home. My wife was like, take some time off. You need to recharge. You've been working for a company you didn't really like working for for years. And so I, ha- I happen to be, take, again, serendipity here, taking time off, being a father, taking care of my kids. But then the pandemic hits. I was on the bus going to the Tennessee-Alabama game at Bridgestone Arena in the SEC tournament when we get word that everything is shutting down. I was on the air that the entire night, that whole week on Sirius, trying to talk about, like, Rudy Gobert spreading COVID and like Tom Hanks getting COVID and the NHL is canceled and college basketball tournaments not going to have fans. And then by Friday, everything is done. And I, I lost every, I lost 75, 80% of my revenue. Like everything I worked for 15 years to build was gone. Uh, my full, my full-time morning show was gone. ESPN radio canceled every, basically said anybody who's part-time is done. Sirius XM wasn't doing live shows anymore either. Like just sports stopped. So all my stuff stopped, and that's when I started hatching the idea of, all right, well, if I want Nashville sports talk to be better, why don't I do something about it? Yeah. <laughs> and then after like three or four months of thinking it all through and planning and having conversations with people that are know more about this stuff than I do, and I'd already kind of had experience with the podcast, I, th- I thought, you know, like, Nashville people deserve better. Let's give them the best Preds show. Let's give them the best Nashville SC show. Let's give them the best Titan show. Let's get, let's, I, let's pinpoint and build these communities of people that really care about this stuff and of course i was going to do an sec show like of course you know this as well as anybody like it's our stuff like the sec is my baby like it is yours and while i do this other stuff uh the sec is always going to be my favorite thing in the world in sports and so of course i was going to launch an sec show uh and so it the amount of time and work it's insane but like when he, when we get down to sit down and do the content like this, there's no more fun. It's that's the most fun part of my entire career is getting now to sit down with somebody I've known for ten years and talk about you know LSU's offense, yeah, for whatever twenty minutes <laughs> and like that's the most fun I have ever, and because that's kind of like what Sirius used to be, and so for me it's now SEC and local and then the college football uh, podcast for for Athlon and uh, I think. I'm curious to see what big companies do with people like us, you know, oh, if, yeah. they, if they want to, if they're going to start gobbling up, because that, that's what happens, right? An industry changes, the model changes, and then the big guys change with it and gobble everything up and then kind of make it their own. You're seeing this with a lot of companies that are launching, they've launched podcast networks. Mm-hmm. And I sort of just did the same thing, but locally in Nashville. But again, I've, I've kept it to where the, the the hosts make the money. There's Nashville music on there. It's all original Nashville for Nashville by Nashville and the SEC show, of course. So, uh, which is again, a little bit more regional, but, uh, I think it's, I don't know why anyone would get their content another way. <laughs> right. I really don't like if I'm a diehard SEC fan, I'm listening to your show. I'm listening to my show. I, you know, sure. You might pop on fine bomb, I guess, if you want to be entertained, but like, I love fine bomb, but like, you know, as, and, and Paul can do the things that we do when he wants to, but again, he's got to play to sort of a different type of science, which is, I've built this expectation that people are going to listen to callers scream at each other. Right. Which is hilarious and entertaining. But it's not the same as, all right, let's look at yards per play pre Liam Cohen at Kentucky and yards per play under Scarangelo last year and look at the yards per play under Liam Cohen. <laughs> right, right. And go, all right, it's clear that Kentucky's <laughs> offense goes like this. <laughs> and, the, and 2021 was the year <laughs> that he was there, and that's why he's back. And so let's have that conversation. And, yeah. And, and while Paul can do that eloquently and brilliantly – he, he can't be too far away from people yelling at each other about Auburn and Alabama, you know? So it's, there's a place for all of it, but I mean, I just believe in our, I believe in our stuff, not you and me personally, but our model. And if I'm an S, if I'm a fan of anything in the world, uh, bourbon, 
<laughs> you know, like a, there's probably a bourbon <laughs> podcast for you. There's probably a bourbon community mm-hmm. that cares about it as much as you do that wants to talk about it in a smart, funny, entertaining way. It's not governed by all the FCC stuff. Right. Like, just cussing. Like, just being able to say shit is so much more fun <laughs> yeah. than doing radio where I have to, like, be careful. Like, I, I remember saying something, and this is funny. Now I'm just, I know you had me in here to ramble, I guess, but so Juwan Jennings gets busted smoking weed uh, on on campus somewhere. I can't remember. I could use Janoris Jenkins. That would be an easy one. He's busted like 56 <laughs> times. But Juwan Jennings is busted. And I was, wor- this is a true story. I was working locally and in Nashville at a local station. And I went on the air and I said, I, I don't care that Juwan Jennings smoked weed. I don't care. And I didn't say anything else about it. I could say that, like, Medical evidence shows you that it's significantly better for you than drinking alcohol. Like, I could go down this list if you'd like me to. The science is in on weed. It's not bad for you. (laughs) And, I mean, everything in moderation. But I say on the air very casually, I'm like, look, I don't care that Juwan Jennings wants to smoke a little weed in college. Next thing you're going to tell me that kids in college have premarital sex, too. Like, (laughs) oh, my God. Like, they're going to drink underage. They're going to smoke weed. They're going to do this stuff. Let's teach them how to be responsible and make the right decisions and put themselves in the right situations to do that stuff because they're going to do it either way. Right. And so on air, I'm saying, like, just sit at your apartment, dude. Like, why are you driving around with a bag of weed in your car? Like, what are you doing? Just sit at your apartment, smoke your bowl, and have a good time. And, like, no one's ever gotten a bar fight stoned either, by the way. (laughs) That's never happened. (laughs) So, like, I kind of joke about it and just, I'm like, Juwan, what are you doing? Sit. We got people calling the station. And I got in trouble from a boss saying... Like, you can't talk like that on the air. I'm like, what do you mean? All I did was say, college kids smoke weed. And you can't, and he's like, well, it's a gateway drug. I'm like, no, that's scientifically, <laughs> I'm like, it's scientifically disproven. It's not a gateway drug. Like, and so I'm like, I'm like, all the arguments that these call, these, these two or three people in Nashville were so upset with me for saying that they call my boss and it just, it just makes the conversation so dumb. Right. And my boss was fine. Like, she was fine. It wasn't her fault. But, like, they're like, you can't say that you don't care if he smokes weed. I'm like, why? I don't care. Here's the medical science to back up why I don't care. Like, and and it's just that kind of stuff, the corporate overlords and the suits and the FCC and all that garbage. It just, it can, it, now we're not talking FCC football. But, no, it like, it, confi- it confines your ability to talk about the stuff you love. And right. why? Why put yourself into that? into that box when you can just sit here like this. <laughs> right. And that, that, that's to your point. I mean, that's what, that's why I started this show. I can say literally anything I want. I can have anyone. And you I do. On. <laughs> yeah. And I don't have no, any influence on what I can and cannot say. I don't have any influence on who I have on the show. Uh, it's funny you say that. Cause that's kind of part of why I launched my company. It's like, I don't want someone telling me what I can and can't say anymore. I'm right. Tired of that. Only one time have I had, and, and I didn't even have them on the show, but someone reached out to be on the show. I didn't know who they were, but I knew it would it would generate some buzz. And it was uh, some country music guy. You you would probably know him better than I. I don't listen to country, but I think his name is like Justin Moore or okay. big big Arkansas fan. Okay, and and I was like, I looked him up. I was like, he's got millions of followers. I was like, fuck you yeah, have this guy on. <laughs> and then he and then he ghosted me. And that was a lesson to me. I felt like that was karma. Like or maybe it wasn't. A per- I mean, who knows what happened? Like you never know. Yeah, I mean, I literally don't know. But he said he was a big fan. He said he wanted to go on the show. I had no idea who he was. I was like, he likes Arkansas. He's got millions of followers. I'll have him on. <laughs> and then he goes to me. So that told me, just don't don't do that. Because that, to me, that's that's getting away from why I started the show. Why I want to show. Oh, you, you're talking about like why you thought. You the only down reason I, I wanted to have him on because he had a following, and you thought you I didn't know. I don't know right. who he is. I still don't right. know who he is. But I think he's a huge arc. He's he was been on Game Day and all this shit. But so I'm sure it would have been a great conversation. But right, right, right. It's not the reason to have someone on because they right. propel your show. Right. You have people on like you because I want to talk to you because I respect you and and you, Go do, on. you do great work. <laughs> and hey, we're here in Nashville. You could come in. Yeah, and yeah. This is fantastic. I, I think you're. Are you pressed for time? You I don't know. Get going? Uh, yeah, I probably need to go. Uh, okay. But before you go, can I was, you, was going to say real, real fast about just music in general. Like one of the things I love about the SEC and music in Nashville does a lot of this, brings it all together because the alumni groups are here from all over the SEC and right. there's so much music here. I, I do think there is something uh, because the South is complicated. It's a, it's a complicated history with complicated stories, tragic stories, and I think what makes SEC football so great, along with Southern music, is sort of how we can kind of like it, it unifies people pretty quickly and if you you can 
you can disagree with somebody on so many different things, but if you're going to sit there and listen to Jason Isbell play guitar or watch Alabama football or, you know, we're going to listen to the Allman Brothers or we're going to, you know, like you could tell those stories. And we do that a lot on our show where we have musicians on to talk about, like, again, I, like the Wild Feathers are a perfect example. They're the so- theme song for the SEC show that we do, Fringe Element podcast. Make sure you check that out everywhere you get your shows. Um, and the drummer's a huge Georgia fan. So we, 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 I've known him for years, and I'm like, why don't you have, you have you ever watched a Georgia game on stage? And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, I got the iPad down there. I got the iPad down there on Saturday nights watching Georgia games while I'm trying to keep up with the song. You know, and, and, and so that's the fun. That's, that's what the point of this model is. So Fringe Element Podcast everywhere you get your SEC podcast. So yeah, that's how, I wanted, that's how I wanted you to close. Tell the audience. You just mentioned Fringe Element. That's it, yeah. I listen to every episode. Can you tell the audience all the res- social media and, and all yeah, the rest uh, of your work? At, at Braden Golf for me, pretty simple. Uh, at 440 Sports, which is my local company here in Nashville. Um, and then Fringe Element Podcast is really the only one that the SEC fans will care about. They'll probably like the cover two as well. We do for Athlon Sports, but the one I own, the one where I get to say whatever I want to say and I don't have to worry about anything <laughs> is Fringe Element Podcast. So um, it's on the YouTube page as well, 440 Sports. So 440 Sports on Twitter. Um, well, who knows where the future goes with it, but it's fun right now and it's profitable and we're having fun and we get to do whatever we want. So um, yeah. yeah, check it out for sure. Thank you for having me, man. I wish we could I'll come in and do this anytime. So. And it heavily features our buddy Stephen Lassen, who's on the show yeah. weekly. So if you can't get yeah. enough of Stephen Lassen, <laughs> head on over to Fringe Element. You know what? Yeah, he's also my co-host <laughs> on the cover too. So like, just if you want as much Stephen Lassen as you can get, you listen to the two of us. 